Hi, Laura. Thank you so, so much for joining She Leads today. I am so excited to have you on the show and just to hear your story. So thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. It's exciting. Yeah. So Laura, you are the founder and CEO of Van Robotics. So what you guys do is you build smart robot tutors using AI machine learning technology to advance academic learning outcomes for the K through eight student, as well as students that are going through who are challenged to learn as effectively and just a challenge learning um, compared to a student, uh, another student. So I'm really excited to hear more about Van Robotics, but just to get started, one thing I love to ask my guests first is take me back to 21 year old, 22 year old Laura graduating college. <laughs> what were you thinking? What did you want to be? What questions were you asking yourself? And just, yeah, how did you navigate your next step? It's a really good question. I, I mean, I'm a late bloomer, so I'll put that out there. Um, when I was graduating from college, I really thought that I would be in a completely different industry. I thought I was going to go into um, business at some point. I thought I would do advertising. I was really drawn to the field, and I thought it was really interesting how words could be used um, in various creative ways to create, you know, an image or a picture. Um, so my undergraduate degree was in writing, it was in English. And so it was a, it's been a long road from there to Van Robotics. Um, but I, I, you know, at that point I was still really not sure where I was going to apply that information. I was a, you know, I kind of took the non-traditional path. I got married, um, a couple years out of college had kids, stayed home. And then when my kids were going back to school, I decided I wanted to go back to school because I, I had a newfound interest in technology and education. So that's, I think, where things kind of started to form into what ultimately became BAN. Wow, that's amazing. So so in this, in this time right after college, did you dabble in advertising and did you go into different industries and you realize, okay, this is not for me. I haven't found my passion yet. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I did. I dabbled here and there. I took a couple of jobs. I was, I did some introductory work for a, a couple of companies and some firms that, that were, um, you know, pretty large in size. And so I got to learn a lot about that, but I didn't really find my foothold there. I just, I didn't, I didn't have the passion for, for that work um, because I didn't really, it was the product that you really have to have a passion for. It was the, the industry that you really needed to feel that way about. And I just, Hadn't found that yet. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, ten, okay, so now you've had kids and that's almost where it seems like you opened your eyes to education and you realize, okay, we can, there's something to improve here in this education sector. So it seems like that came first and then robotics or how were you navigating yeah. once you knew, okay, this is where I'm passionate about. Yeah. So actually before then I was really interested in technology, but I I sort of had a habit and a hobby of kind of working on computers and, and I was doing a lot of sort of off the chart, off the um, sort of mainstream things with computers to try to learn programming. And I, yeah. I found myself very attracted to that. I was like, this is very cool. This is very much, you know, sort of my speed, the, the logic of it and having building something from scratch. It just really appealed to me. So I had started with that. Um, when my kids went back to school, I was getting my master's in computer science. Right. So I, I made the switch from English to technology somewhere in the middle there when I realized I was really drawn to computers and programming and the logic of it, building things. And then when my kids went back to school as a part-time job, I was an adjunct professor for a while and I loved it. I loved teaching. I, I just mm -hmm. completely felt like, okay, this is something I could do for a while. Yeah. Um, so it just kind of merged the two. I was teaching um, at the college level, but I was also really focusing on technology and, and really kind of conveying those concepts to new students. Yeah. So did you have people or mentors guiding you and telling you you may be interested <laughs> in computer science? Because English compared to computer science is very different. And like writing a lot, it's just a completely different mindset almost. So how did you even come across it? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I didn't really. I just kind of fell into it. It was one of those things where somebody needed their computer fixed, for example, and I would go and so solve, you know, search for the solution, how to fix it, and how to how to make it work better. And and it kind of just drew me in. So I I can't say that I had 
a, a mentor at that time specifically. Yeah. But since then, I've definitely had great mentors that have kind of guided me. Once I found my foothold, like, okay, this is what I really want to do, or this is what I really like, yeah. then I think those mentors have really sort of um, helped guide that path. Amazing. Amazing. So tell me now the founding of Van Robotics. First of all, did you see yourself as an entrepreneur or as someone who can, is going to start something yourself or where did you even discover what entrepreneurship was in this idea where, okay, you know what? I can, I can be the, the founder and start something. Sure. Yeah. That's a great question. No, I definitely didn't see myself as an entrepreneur uh, up until the point that I realized the impact that we could have as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I think that was the light bulb moment when I, I was a, an academic and I was doing a lot of research and I was conducting studies and I, I saw the, the great results that we were getting um, and the, the potential that the technology we were building could have. Yeah. And I realized that if I continued down that road, it could be great. We could, we could discover some new things. And I just felt for me that it would have limited the impact we could have on a larger scale. And so that's when I decided that I needed to learn more about this entrepreneurship thing. And I got into the, I was at Yale at the time, I was working as a research scientist and I was accepted into the venture creation program, which is part of their entrepreneurial institute. Mm -hmm. And, and that was really sort of the beginning that got the ball rolling. They, they, you know, it was sort of an accelerated program in the summer. So we learned a lot about, you know, the basics of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And then from there, um, that's when sort of the, the entrepreneurship uh, I guess the the dedication, the jumping off the cliff moment happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> Left my job there at Yale and went full force into entrepreneurship full time. Wow. And is it during this time as well that you came up with Van Robotics and almost integrating robots with education? Yeah, I think it was during my research career, actually, that I, I realized like, okay, I've learned this, this worked, this didn't. I learned that, that worked, this didn't. How do I merge these things together to create one technology that I felt could be really potentially powerful and impactful in students' lives? And so that's where that's where the idea was kind of born and, and that's really where it developed. So by the time I was ready to leave my position there as a researcher, I had already pretty much had a pretty solid idea of what that technology would look like. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you ever have people doubting you or questioning what you're doing being like no robots can't teach students or this is just this industry is too hard to go into don't do it all the time really so all the time. so how did you did you just you were just confident enough to know no this is going to work or how did you deal with that no, I mean you know it's a great question because I, I honestly I think everybody that I've talked to has been told that like yeah. you're crazy this isn't going to work yeah you know how many people fail in this and yeah, that's nice patting you on the head. Like, that's a great idea, you know, kind of that that sort of yeah. I, that sort of uh, response. I think I've had it more times than I can count. Um, but I, I think that what got me through that is probably um, I have, you know, very stubborn. I think once I know something to be true, it's very difficult to get me to move off of that block. If I've done, if I put in the, you know, sufficient research and the testing of the hypothesis and all that kind of stuff, once. I'm there, yeah. it's, it's almost like, um, yeah, it hurts getting that kind of feedback. And it's sure it, it definitely makes you question, but it didn't ever make me change my belief. Yeah. So that's yeah. the thing I think is, I think you, I think when you're so convinced that, you know, this is something that you, you, you know, personally, because you've been there, you've walked the walk and you've tested the product or the idea. Um, that's what you have to cling to yeah. is, you had that, that conviction. I think that's yeah. what drove you. Yeah. So exactly. in the very early stages, so you, you mentioned how you tested the idea. And one thing that you learn in entrepreneurship is the idea of having an MVP and really not building the perfect product, but having it enough to test it and really see if there's traction. So right. I'm wondering with robots, it's obviously, I'm not very, very experienced with robots and just that whole idea, but it is a technology that takes years to build and perfect. So how did you navigate building that MVP and really seeing like, oh, this could be an effective method to teach students? Yeah. Um, so, so the way we navigated the MVP, when, when I was leaving my position at Yale, I knew we needed a little bit of sort of seed money to get things off the ground. So yeah. we needed some money to buy materials and to buy the, the physical, you know, 
the components basically to put together the robots. Yeah. Um, we also needed a little extra money to pay for people. So what I did was I, I looked around for some startup friendly incubators and um, organizations that would support us through grants. Mm -hmm. So there was no, there was no equity commitment. There was no layout of any promise sort of in the future. It was just basically, here's a small grant. I think the first one we got was 25 K it was large enough to support the components and, and building and to support a little bit of extra work for, um, you know, subcontractors, people that we could just quickly hire and say, Hey, can you create this CAD really quick? Hey, can you, you know, um, can you, uh, you know, put this together, this yeah. physical, you know, robot that we were building from scratch. And so that 25 K was really instrumental in helping us kind of get the proof of concept, the MVP off the ground. Definitely. Great. So now bring me, as your as Van Robotics is growing and you guys are have developed the how do you is it A B I I or how do you pronounce Abi? Abi. Yeah. Okay. So as yeah. you're developing Abi, um, what were the biggest challenges that you had? And the yeah, like a key challenge that sticks out that you're like, wow, looking back, I'm like, it's crazy that we got through that, but we did. Yes. Huge. Funding. Okay. <laughs> I think in a nutshell. Yeah. Funding is is the oxygen to every startup, right? I mean, if you if you don't have any funding, if you don't have any cash, it's really difficult to to you know to not only prove your concept but to also gain any traction. Um, so funding was probably the most difficult. I think right after I left Yale and I got that first grant, a few months later I applied for the TechStars Accelerator Program, and that was the next step um, in terms of being able to have the capital, have the training that I needed to learn how to not only build a product, but also how to build a good company with a good, strong foundation yeah. to build, you know, and to ultimately support the people that would build the product. So yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge, funding. So, okay. So going off of funding, one thing that I, I ask is as a female founder, obviously there's still, it's unfortunate, but there's still a gap between female funders and founders compared to male. And so I'm wondering, did you ever, did you ever feel that because you're a female, because you're starting a tech company, all of this, does this impact how investors viewed you and your company and whether they give money? Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. How did you, what did you, like, what, what advice can you give to other females? Like, how do you go through that? Yeah, I think that's a, it's tricky, right? I mean, there, I, I think it's different, different for everyone that goes through the process. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that's really important always to remember is who you are, mm. right? Um, no matter who you are, no matter what that looks like for you, I think you need to remember that going into any investor meeting, any pitch competition, anything that you do, I think, for your company, um, representing your company, is to stay true to that. Yeah. Because I think that ultimately will will really impact the success that you have with your company. It's your company. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that we tend to do is there is a lot of, unfortunately, there is a lot of um, bias in the funding process. Yeah. It's been proven. There's been studies and all of that good stuff. But um, you will find the right people. Mm -hmm. If you remember who you are and you stay true to that, I think, and you stick with it, you know, that whole, you know, um, stick with itness. I think it's important because, um, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of lose that momentum when you feel like, okay, I just need this X amount of dollars to get to the next level. And everybody keeps saying no and no and no and no. Um, you know, I think we, there's a, there's a good number of resources available for us yeah. as women. And, um, and now the, the network of women is growing. Yeah. So even though they may not be with you right where you are, um, I think it's important to have that and know that there are other women out there who've got your back. Yeah. Uh, so, definitely. and I feel like based on based on you talking, I, there's a sense of resiliency and persistence that you have to have. You just have to almost have trust in what you're building and in yourself, being like, okay, it's another no, but eventually they'll get a yes. Is that? Do yeah. You feel that? Yeah. Yeah, because I think in the beginning, you know, when I was going fundraising, I thought, you know, the investors had sort of this upper hand somehow, like they kind of owned the show. And somehow there's this little piece of you that might be convinced that they have some impact on your success or failure. Yeah. But the reality is they don't. 
right? Yeah. That person is just one person in the millions of people who may impact your success or failure. Mm. So that person may just not be the right person to be part of your success. And that's, I think, what we need to tell ourselves because that, that's accurate, right? Yeah. Whether people fund you or not, they don't get to decide your success or failure. Yeah, I that's- love it. So sticking to this just for one more, one more question, then we'll move on to van <laughs> robotics. But I am wondering, as a leader, you almost have to, how do you develop the tools to almost put this front to your employees being like, we're okay. Whereas like you could be dealing with, you know, finding funding and like the scariness of whether you're going to make payroll for them and things like that. Like, how do you balance like the front that you give them versus what, like making sure that you are also okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had that exact same question when I was at Techstars, they had this program where they assigned a mentor to you. So I had a mentor at Techstars who was specifically just to mentor me as the CEO to walk me through some of these questions. I had the exact same question that you did. How do I present this front that everything is cool, everything's fine and under control when maybe like behind the scenes it's all falling apart, right? (laughs) I'm, you know, chewing gum and sticks holding it together. And he was like, why? Why do you have to do that? Yeah. Why are you presenting that front? Why aren't you transparent with your employees and, and your team, really? Because they're in it with you, mm. right? They're yeah. all, and you're, you really are all in it together. And so transparency has been my, my go-to, my number one. I'm, you know, I'm transparent with everybody so they understand where we are, where we're going. Um, we celebrate the successes, you know, we freak out sometimes when things are a little tight, yeah. but um, that's by far been, I think it's, it's the best thing for your own sanity, but also for your team because they, they genuinely are a part of this journey. I love that. I think that's, I think that's so important. And even from their, from the employee perspective, they want to be involved in something where yeah. they, they're in the loop. They, they know what's are. happening. Definitely. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So going into Van Robotics, tell me a little bit about the impact that Avi and just Van Robotics has had on education and yeah, just in general, how has it been today? It's been exciting. I mean, we, we literally had our first shipment of robots in December. Wow. Um, so we shipped or sold our officially our first robot in January. And since then we are now in 40, more than 40 organizations. We're in 14 States. Um, we're getting, we, we get inundated with um, messages from not only parents that want to buy the home edition, we just rolled out the home edition for the COVID yeah. uh, to help with the COVID um, situation, but also we're getting calls from teachers and from district level, you know, people who are worried about the fall, right? Because all of these kids have been out of school for three months plus summer's coming. It's another three months. Yeah. It's a little bit of melee. And um, unfortunately we're going to have a, a larger population of kids that are gonna, now going to be below proficient and that delta between the kids that are proficient and those that aren't is going to be much wider. So wow. it's going really well. I, we feel like we're, we're doing good things and, um, and you know, we're keeping, we're just keeping up with the demand right now. I'm yeah. sure. Cause how did you almost, once you, once COVID happened and education was obviously very stunted by this and t- and parents are now teaching their kids while they have work to do. So it's just a lot of challenges came with it. How did you as a company be like, okay, this is a big time for us. We need to, like, a lot of changes can happen for us. How did you prepare for that? Yeah, I think one of the best things that we did, we didn't even know we were doing it that would help, you know, we knew we were doing it, but we didn't know it was going to help us in this kind of situation was we have, we have a very structured sort of um, team meetings. So every morning we do stand-ups at nine. Yeah. Every Fridays we have KPIs, which are key performance indicator meetings, right, on Fridays. So we do the whole you know, how was the week? What are your goals for next week? And that structure has helped us tremendously in not only goals, um, sort of milestone planning, but also it helps us to understand where our challenges are in a much more real way. And then the team gets to see it so that we understand when one part of the team may be more stressed than the other. So there's a, there's a better, I think that communication gives us a better overall sense for where the team is and what's happening overall. Yeah. We were able to come together in one of those meetings to to really fast track the home edition release. And I think that was really important because we weren't planning to launch it until end of the year. Um, but the team kind of all, you know, we were all on the same page. We're like, yes, let's, we should do this. Yeah. And, you know, we all kind of divided up the work and, 
and decided how it was going to be and how long it would take us to get it out there. And, and we did it and it was, you know, purely a team effort. Yeah. So I think that that structure is really helpful. I think that's great. And you were able to just keep that structure going into it. So I think that was probably very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So when I, so last question, before we go into our fun questions, I'm wondering <laughs> about robots and education. So one thing that is so important for a tutor to have is that empathy and that patience with the student and really like really feeding off of what the student needs. So right. from the outsider, when I see a robot, I think, okay, it's great, but I feel like it could lack that empathy and that patience and really like building that relationship. So how That's did, right. yeah, how did you navigate around that? Does, does your robots like, how do you, yeah, how do you take that into consideration almost? Yeah. Um, well, we don't, you know, the robots can't feel anything, so they're not empathetic. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that out there. But the robots are social. They give lots of positive feedback. And these are really robots that are the one that we're currently selling is for the K-5 student. Okay. So there's a lot of social um, behaviors that the robot does to help encourage mm -hmm. and to build sort of that confidence in a skill when they may not have it. Um, so it gives lots of, you know, high fives and fist bumps and like, I believe in you, you can do this, you know, this is good. Yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, one of the sort of the, the benefits of having a one-on-one -on -one tutor is that you get that empathy, you get that patience and like, they see when you're getting stressed and they may pull back. Um, but the other side of that is kids can get really embarrassed if they don't master a skill, mm -hmm. especially in front of their friends or even in front of their tutor, um, if they lack that confidence. Yeah. So having that sort of enclosed space where they can, they can work with this little social, cute little animated object um, gives them the freedom to kind of get things wrong and not feel bad yeah. and then stay engaged so that they can actually stay tuned to how to actually solve that problem. Um, you know, a lot of kids will just shut down. So yeah. I think the opposite, yes, it's not empathetic. And there are, you, you know, the robots will never, in my mind and, and in my viewpoint, they, they will never replace people. Mm. Um, we wouldn't, we would never want to do that. And obviously they're, um, the robots are really just, intended to supplement in ways that, you know, that are different, you know, they're just, mm -hmm. it's a different interaction. It's kind of like when a, when a child sort of names one of their favorite objects and they pretend they can talk to it and move it around. That's a similar rapport yeah. that they have with the robot. Yeah. I, I, that's great. I like that. I didn't consider the aspect of, cause it's true when kids, when they make mistake, they're shy about it or they just, they feel demotivated completely. And I think that's a, I think the robot brings a great dimension to that aspect. So I like that. So what do you think is the future? What do you imagine the future of Van Robotics? I think um, we, we are in the business of developing robots that can be used right now for the K-5 student. But we have a, a great um, future in terms of really developing the robot as a platform. Mm. So, for example, we have, uh, we've gotten a lot of calls about homeschools homeschoolers that want to use the robot for teaching various subjects that we don't currently have available. Yeah. Um, so this lesson creation tool is a clickable interface that allows educators and parents and even students to create their own lessons. Um, we're really excited about this because this will be uh, the backbone to developing content from, you know, across the globe in different languages, wow. but also across the subjects uh, range. So you can think of anything from socio-emotional learning all the way through, you know, uh, um, coding and machine learning concepts. Um, and, and so everything, you know, that can be developed on the robot is now being supported with this simple to use web app. So we envision this to be sort of a tool and a platform that can be used in a number of different ways. Yeah, definitely. I love it. So, okay, Laura, tell me, what is a passion or hobby that you have that's just completely unrelated to your work? I love hiking. Ooh, hiking. Yeah. As far and as wide as I can find a place to go hiking. <laughs> I love it. It's almost meditative. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Okay, and then the last question is, what is a fun or weird talent that you have that no one else really knows about? So I'm going to go first. Okay. So mine is blueberry throwing and catching. So I'm going to give you a preview. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Here's blueberry. Okay. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> that was a little, <laughs> bit of a, a little bit of a scare.
sketchy throw, but I, you know, I got it together. It's all good. You got it. You did it. That's amazing. Thank you. Gosh, I wish I had a cool skill like that. I need to get some blueberries in practice. Um, what is a good, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of an interesting skill people don't know that I have. Um, I can speak Spanish fluently. That's not really a, it's not really a, a weird skill. I'm trying to think of something else that I could do that nobody else knows that I can do. I probably, I don't know. It's I could probably one. eat people under the table in terms of pizza. I could probably eat more pizza than people think I can eat. Okay. I'll accept that. <laughs> I'm not sure if that, that qualifies, but That's yeah. okay. That's good for, that's good for now. Um, but Laura, I just want to thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's been so fun and honestly so interesting for me just to learn about this integration of robotics and education. Thank so you. I think it's great. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it, Carly. Of course.